And so we're actually submerging you, simulating a submerging in a certain amount of seawater. And it's that pressure that actually drives oxygen, not only on your red blood cells, but actually in the liquid or the plasma of your bloodstream. So the liquid or the plasma has very little oxygen in it at sea level. And the only way to get more oxygen into that plasma, that liquid, is by giving more pressure in the body or simulating that pressure that you would feel under seawater. So... Hope you're drinking your water. And if you need help drinking water, you can add Element, that's L-M-N-T, to your water. This is one of the sponsors of the show. It contains a science-backed electrolyte ratio, 1,000 milligrams of sodium, 200 milligrams of potassium, 60 milligrams of magnesium. I have found clinically it has really helped people with restless leg or those that struggle with hydration. No coloring, no artificial ingredients, no gluten for those of you who care, no fillers, and doesn't matter what kind of diet plan you follow. Element can help prevent and eliminate headaches, muscle cramps, fatigue. Of course, check with your doctor first, but this is an incredible product. And when you sweat, you definitely lose sodium. Athletes can lose up to seven grams per day. That's a real sweaty person. Go to drinkelement.com slash Dr. Lion. That's D-R-I-N-K-L-M-N-T dot com slash Dr. Lion for a free sample pack when you order this way. And actually, it's totally risk-free. If you don't like it, give it away. Welcome, Dr. Scott Schur. I am so happy to have you in person. I know, in person. This is amazing. It's this is your first time. in-person podcast in years. In years. In, in somebody's house during the pandemic, like early on when it was like a secret, you couldn't go to people's houses. I went to somebody's house and I recorded a podcast. But the funny thing is that she didn't actually re actually release it until like four months ago. So <laughs> it was funny to listen to, but well, it's nice to be in person. I am very excited to have you. And there's a couple reasons. Number one, you are board certified in internal medicine. Mm -hmm. You are certified in hyperbaric medicine, which is very important. Incredibly articulate and smart. I'll no, do my best. <laughs> no pressure here. No, no pressure, pressure here. Yeah. And I think that hyperbaric therapy is something that people are just starting to learn about. Mm -hmm. And that's really going to be only one aspect of what we talk about. We're going to talk about hyperbaric. We're going to talk about the integrated approach, mm -hmm. which you are a very as the son of a chiropractor, very integrated in your thinking. Absolutely. And um, that's where we're gonna go. I'm excited. You get to, you, it's player's choice. <laughs> Let's talk about hyperbaric therapy. Let's talk about number one, what is it? Sure. Who is it for? Is it just disease prevention, disease treatment, mm. or is there a place for optimization? Sure. So the way I like to think about hyperbaric therapy, it's not if hyperbaric therapy will be helpful, it's when. And what is and the ideas are very simple. It's just a combination of increased atmospheric pressure and increased inspired oxygen. So everybody understands oxygen. It's something that we breathe. There's 21% in the oxygen that you're breathing at sea level. I live in Colorado, so I'm about 16% oxygen down up there. So you have, le you have less I have less. Yeah, so oxygen. The higher in altitude you go, you go to Mount Everest, for everybody knows this, right? People die of oxygen hypoxia, right? Because they don't get enough oxygen if they're not trained to go up there. So we know that we're usually breathing 21% oxygen. And in the air we're breathing, that's all we typically need to do everything that we need physiologically to function. And we know this because you can put something on a, your finger called a pulse oximeter, right? A pulse oximeter is something that measures how much oxygen is in your bloodstream, but not exactly. It actually measures how much oxygen is on your hemoglobin molecules, which is on your red blood cells that carry oxygen. And that's going to be important because the other aspect of what we do in a hyperbaric environment is increase the amount of pressure. So pressure is the simulated pressure you would feel under a certain amount of seawater. We all know that water is heavy. If you go and pick up a bucket of water, this is extremely heavy. And so we're actually submerging you, simulating a submerging in a certain amount of seawater. And it's that pressure that actually drives oxygen not only on your red blood cells, but actually in the liquid or the plasma of your bloodstream. So the liquid or the plasma has very little oxygen in it at sea level. And the only way to get more oxygen into that plasma, that liquid, is by giving more pressure in the body or simulating that pressure that you would feel under seawater. So red blood cells typically carry oxygen, and that's what's called your oxygen carrying capacity. And so there's ways to increase your red blood cell number. One is by going altitude training. So you can come to Colorado, come visit, and you stay there for a couple months, you're going to increase the number of red blood cells you have in circulation. The faster way and the ways that others have done 
called doping would be taking something called epigen, which is the hormone that's secreted by your kidneys that increases the number of red blood cells in circulation. And why do we care about having more red blood cells? Because we can perform better? Exactly. Because the more oxygen you have, the more energy you can produce for a longer period of time. So oxygen is extremely important, of course, because it's the final need in your mitochondria to make energy. So you make ATP because you have oxygen. When you run out of oxygen, you don't make energy very effectively at all. And so now we're putting in 1,200% more oxygen up to in a hyperbaric environment. Not always, but that's, that's about 2.4 atmospheres, which is the equivalent of about 45 feet of seawater pressure that we're simulating. So 45 feet of seawater, 100% oxygen, 1,200% more oxygen in circulation. Do people feel that immediately? So some people do. Uh, it often depends on why somebody's going into the chamber. And it's very interesting because when you immediately go in the chamber, there's a number of things that are also immediately happening. The first thing is that you're immediately getting all that oxygen in circulation, obviously. And so when you have all that oxygen in circulation, you're going to make more energy. So some people feel all of a sudden like their lights have finally turned on. Like if you've had a brain injury or any cognitive issues, all of a sudden like the fatigue is gone, but not always interestingly, because you have, if you have a lot of inflammation, if you have a lot of cellular debris, garbage, oxidative stress, that can be a challenge because what's happening is that all that oxygen is going in circulation and you're also creating an oxygen load that's going to result in what's called oxidative stress or reactive oxygen species or the body's cellular meta metabolic waste products, right? That can build up and you have to have the ability to balance those out with your body's ability to make what's called a reactive antioxidant surge. So everybody knows antioxidants, your, your vitamin A, your vitamin D, you know, vitamin C and others that are help. And then glutathione is another one that everybody knows about now. So you have to have this reactive antioxidant surge. That happens after about three days of hyperbaric therapy in sessions in a row, so three sessions in a row. Actually, Dr. Dom Diagostino did this work a number of years ago. And, and so, but if you are pretty oxidative, if you're inflammatory already, you may not feel good right away. When you go in, you may actually feel worse. Mm -hmm. And this can happen if you have an infection or you're just under high oxidative load. But it, it sort of, that's why it's really important to kind of know who the person is that's going into the chamber. So if you have an acute need, like an acute trauma, hyperbaric therapy is fantastic because if you've had an acute heart attack, acute stroke, acute brain injury, um, if you had a spinal cord injury, we know that hyperbaric therapy is going to save tissue as soon as it's safe for you to get into a chamber. I often say that don't come to me first, go to the hospital if you have a stroke or a heart attack. Hyperbaric doctors have been known to just go into chambers and reverse their strokes and heart attacks and things like that. But a lot of these guys are former military and kind of cowboys, you know. <laughs> I, know I, think you I have, know that well. I think you have some <laughs> experience there. Mm -hmm. But anyway, so once you're stabilized, we know that if you can get revascularized and then get into a, a hyperbaric chamber for a heart attack or a stroke, you're going to do better. So we know that from an acute trauma perspective, this is how I learned about hyperbaric therapy and acute trauma, like limb amputations, chronic or actually severe acute infections, carbon monoxide poisoning, like burns, you can see these immediate shifts very, very quickly because all that oxygen is going in circulation. But over the long term, and that's the deal with hyperbaric therapy for most people, is that you're really looking for a long-term shift in what we call your epigenetics. You're shifting in how you're expressing the genes that are on your DNA so that you're growing more blood vessels, that you're releasing more stem cells, that you're making new connective tissue, new bone, new heart, new neurons, new connective tissue within your brain, like the like uh, different types of cells in your in your brain, for example. So the idea is that you're re you're shifting and recalibrating the system with a longer term hyperbaric protocol, and that's where it, when it comes down to looking at things like disease conditions. Absolutely, anything that has a wound, hyperbaric therapy can most likely help you. Okay, anything that has inflammation, anything that has hypoxia, anything that needs stem cells, anything that has an infection, most likely hyperbaric therapy is going to help you. So that's pretty broad, right? But then if you don't have any of those things or you don't have any acute needs for those things, but you want long-term optimization of your brain, of your heart, of your genital organs, there's been studies on erectile dysfunction. I know. I was just looking therapy. at that. I was yeah. just looking at that. One of my favorite things to show on lecture slides is a picture of a penis that's Which under, now you've gotten no, everybody's attention. <laughs> but, it, but it's an MRI. Yeah. It's an MRI. It's a functional MRI mm -hmm. of the penis that shows blood flow before and after a hyperbaric protocol. And you can see the difference in blood flow. And this is actually manifesting in obviously better, better erections as well. But nobody knows what it is when I put it on the screen, which is great. <laughs> yeah. yeah. That, so when you think about, so we have the significant diseases like yes. stroke, heart attack, um, acute, probably acute TBI. Yes. There's a new study now going on as well on, that, on acute traumatic brain injury. And then what about the average person walking around sure. who, let's say, 
has erectile dysfunction, is starting to have cognitive issues or just really low energy, mm -hmm. um, athletic performance, who, when it comes to the spectrum right. of right. the average person walking around, would right. they benefit from so Hyperbaric? the answer is yes, but. Ooh, I always. love a yes, but. Yeah, because the idea here is that there's 14 indications that are covered by insurance in the United States. Is it easy to get coverage? So if you have one of those 14 indications, it's relatively easy to get coverage. The, the four that are most common are diabetic foot ulcers, radiation injury from cancer treatment. So uh, this is people that have had radiation therapy for cancer, and then they have radiation injury related to the cancer therapy. Uh, it's vastly underutilized for this particular indication, but it's really effective if you can get people into hyperbaric environments to help with their radiation injuries. 80% improvements or higher, you know, no matter where the radiation was. Which is incredible. Yeah, it's, it's like there's no better treatment for radiation injury than hyperbaric therapy. And actually the data plays that out, which is really great. And then there's also chronic bone infections, osteomyelitis, sudden hearing loss, sudden sensory neural hearing loss. This is like the way people will describe it as they wake up one day and they can't hear out of one of their ears, it's actually pretty devastating for people. What about ringing in the ears? Does so tinnitus is interesting, right? So tinnitus, tinnitus is, a, is a sort of end result of probably multiple different types of conditions altogether. So there's noise induced, there's, there's neurologic, uh, there is probably idiopathic, which is we, we don't know, and then there's also probably infectious related too. I've actually had improvements in almost everybody, but they have to be relatively acutely treated. If it's been going on for a long period of time, I've had some some benefit for people with noise-induced hearing, but it's not something that I'll immediately put somebody in a chamber for. But uh, when it comes to these FDA, sort of the FDA approved, the insurance approved indications, it's these are hard to back into in the sense that if you don't have what exactly that diagnosis is, it's very difficult for you to get those diagnoses and get into the chamber for those things. Now, on the other side of it, which is the non-FDA or the investigational side, there which is- Which is always usually which incredibly is, interesting and And this is valuable. where I live, yes. right? And this is where I am. And this is where you're talking about the average person that comes to see me. The average person that I get a call about will say, you know, hey, Dr. Scott, I have migraines. Should I go into a hyperbaric chamber? And I go, hyperbaric therapy may help you, but let's talk about optimizing your health first, right? And this is where it comes down to me understanding a number of years ago that I was doing a disservice for my patients for just putting them in a hyperbaric chamber. And I, I almost gave a lecture a couple of years ago, I was actually disinvited in the, because I was going to give a lecture that said, please don't put them in the chamber. <laughs> and you got uninvited? For other reasons, maybe, I don't know, but it's all good. Right. Um, but so my deal is always- I love that, I love well, that. that. I mean, means... that's the thing, right? Because like, I'm not in this just to put somebody in the hyperbaric chamber. Like. There's a great skit, you might have seen this in medical school too, this is like early YouTube. It's like, if you have a heart, you get an EKG and, a, and you get an echocardiogram, if you're a cardiologist, right? Like the, you go to the cardiologist, you get those things. You go to a pulmonologist, you get a chest x-ray, you get pulmonary, pulmonary function tests, right? You go to a neurologist, you get an EEG and you get like a brain MRI, right? Everybody has their own things that they do because these are the things that they do every single time. And I just, I just don't work that way. So oftentimes 80% of what I talk to people about has nothing to do with hyperbaric therapy at all. It has to do with my integrative approach, which is first starting with found foundational health kinds of ideas and then building from there. And what are those? So I learned from a doc uh, maybe about four or five years ago that there was a way to approach health that was very similar in some ways to how I grew up, the son of a chiropractor understanding that the body had its own innate abilities to heal if you gave it the tools. But as a son of a chiropractor, my father was doing a lot of this intuitively, doing it with chiropractic adjustment, with dietary changes, with all these crazy different things that he had in, his, in our house, like the Nordic tracks of the world and you know whatever else. You remember that from the 1980s. That thing's great. I think it's still around. Uh, anyway, but um, so I grew up in that framework, but then I found out there was ways that you can actually do quantification and understand what's happening on, on the cellular side of things at the same time, along with practices, dietary changes, supplements that are targeted to what people need. And so we use, and I use a framework that's based on metabolomics, which is a big word, but all that really means is that we're looking at real time cellular processes of vitamins, minerals, nutrients, gut health, hormone health, immune health, et cetera. So, and you're doing that all in a foundational way and then you're building people up from there. So the approach isn't one that's disease focused. And so I often, we often say that we set disease aside and just focus on optimizing their cellular health, their gut health, their immune health, their hormone health. And you do that through a number of different ways, but, and when we, but metabolomics is that foundation. And then we do data-driven 
supplements and practice changes and lifestyle habits and things like that. And then once you're doing all of that, then it's so much easier to help people. I mean, you know this from your own practice, right? It's the easy things. It's sleep, it's hydration, it's the food, it's relationships, it's connection, it's et cetera. So you start all with that if you can, but you got to find your angle, right? So what is your angle? For my angle is typically hyperbaric therapy in the sense that they come to find me and now I'm talking to them about optimizing their health. They're like, wait, I thought we were talking about hyperbaric oxygen therapy. I'm like, yeah, we're, we're going to get there. That's the easy part. You just sit in the chamber. I'll talk to you all about it, right? But that is, that's easy. All you have to do is go there and sit in the chamber. And it's, I mean, there's certain things that you can do. And then my framework shifts from that optimizing health piece to that, what are we doing before, during, and after hyperbaric oxygen therapy that's really going to optimize your time that you're spending in a chamber, which is expensive, and also, I'd love for you to share what a typical protocol yeah. is. You know, for the the military operators, they yeah. might be doing sixty to eighty dives, and right. it might take. This is obviously uh, for a traumatic brain injury. Right. It might take um, what is it? Two hours in the chamber. It can, yeah. Per session, five days in a row. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And and that may be on the extreme end. Well, it's a really good point, right? Because from the acute side, if you have an acute injury there is no better treatment or at least adjunctive treatment it may not be the only treatment but hyperbaric therapy is going to rev up the healing process going to let you heal faster i mean i see it in athletes i see it in forward operators i see it in a lot of different people you get an injury you get into hyperbaric chamber you heal about 30 to 70 percent faster okay so and that's over like three to ten sessions so usually not a that's, huge amount of that's sessions. not a lot of no sessions. it's not a huge amount but you can see that shift because you're just letting the body rev up the processes of healing faster. So more stem cells, you're getting more inflammation to go down so faster. So what would be an example if someone yeah. breaks an arm, for an athlete, yeah. if they fall, break an arm, when would you exactly. put them in the chamber? So I have had a couple of people, like when I first started with the Tommy John surgeries are really common, right? So these are at, these are pitchers that want to extend their careers in the, in the MLB. And what they do is they get these surgeries that this crazy surgery on their elbows. And it's about a 12 month recovery period, I think, at least, at least it used to be. We used to be able to cut that down by 50%. For people to go back and so and that i see this in weekend warriors this is you don't have to be like a, 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 a top level athlete this is somebody that you're working i mean most people that get hurt even in the military you know this is not like in the theater it's like playing basketball i don't know if you know this about me but for a little while when i you finished, were a professional basketball player. no well that <laughs> you got me <laughs> damn i wish that would have been I nice knew it. but but i was actually doing va compensation and pension exams i did them for about five years, and I saw a lot of people, and this is when I was in California, and I found that what most people, when they got injured, when they were playing basketball on the deck of their ship, and they weren't getting injured actually when they were in the theater, uh, in the field or whatever. So, but anyway, I, I, I've, I've seen over the years that if we can get people into the chamber fast, you can see like 30%, 30 to 50%, up, up to 70%, <clears throat> excuse me, improvements in their recovery time. And this is over like three to 10 sessions. Now, if you How have- How long does the sessions last? So each session is usually between 60 and 90 minutes. Is there a defining reason why someone would go 60 versus 90? Because the pressure yeah. is always the same. No, we change the pressures. So the pressures vary depending on what our indication is. And so we have neurologic pressures and we have what I would call systemic pressures. And so neurologic pressures are typically between 1.3 and two atmospheres, which is the equivalent of about 13 feet of seawater, to 33 feet of seawater. And just out of curiosity, yeah. nobody would ever, there's no other way to stimulate hyperbarics other than actually going diving, right? There would be no, or is that? So the question is, can you get oxygen in this amount in the body in any other way, it, right? Yeah, that's and exactly there really the is no other way. There are some other technologies that will say that they can, but there's really no evidence. There's one technology called exercise with oxygen therapy. And so they like to compare themselves to hyperbaric oxygen therapy, but there's no s evidence that they really have any major And mechanistically, shift. it Me doesn't make sense. No, they, they're, they're, they, they base a lot of their work on a book that was made in the 1980s by this guy, Arden, and it's very interesting. And the idea of, this is, this is, this is for a different topic, but it's like, it gets very sciencey, but like the idea that we're not getting blood flow everywhere all at the same time, that we're have these like little sphincters that hold where blood doesn't go. And then you can open those up. Yeah, and lots of sphincters. Oxygen. <laughs> <laughs> well, your husband too, you know, anyway, he's going to, you know, you're talking yeah, about yeah. that earlier. So we, and you have a urologist coming on yep. soon too, you said. So anyway, um, sphincters, yes, as sphincter says anyway. Um, but regardless, I think that 
there really is no way to get that much oxygen in circulation. However, there is ways to utilize oxygen better for all of us, right? Because all of us have these things called mitochondria in our cells that need oxygen to make energy, but not all of us are making energy very effectively. And so I had this question recently, it's a really good one. It's like, well, what if my oxygen levels are normal, but I still don't feel good, right? I still have fatigue, I still have brain fog. I mean, and that often is an energy metabolic issue in the sense that you're not getting enough energy produced in the cells that need them and your brain and your liver as uh, your actually your muscles have the most mitochondria per cell you know this of course but your brain I had, a, I had a suspicion yes but your brain and your liver are like second and, and your and your heart are like the other ones that have the most mitochondria and so if you are energy intensive that's where you're going to have a hard time if you can't make energy effectively in your brain, in your heart, in your liver, et cetera, to detox, to obviously to do cardiac work, et cetera. So when, the way I think about this always is not so much, obviously you can get more oxygen in circulation in the chamber, but at the same time, are you optimizing energy metabolism? Are you optimizing energy production capability? So that's why it's important to measure things like your vitamins, your minerals, your nutrients. You know, if your gut's leaky, if you're inflamed, if your oxidative stress is up through the roof, you're not gonna make energy well. And so when somebody comes in and they want long-term optimization strategies with me, I always say, well, it's not about hyperbaric therapy first. Now, the Israelis have proved me somewhat wrong because they've done, they did a large study a cohort study a couple of years ago they published on anti-aging or reverse aging as they call it. And they looked at telomere length, they looked at senescent cells, they looked at brain imaging before and after a 60 session, six zero session hyperbaric protocol, Monday through Friday, weekends off, two atmospheres, 90 minutes in the chamber using something called air breaks. Which By the I'll way, everyone about. is sitting there going, how would I ever have time for this? Exactly, right? So. So th this, is, this is where I'm going is that, so what they did is they, they didn't do anything to these people. They just had them go into hyperbaric chamber for three months and with the weekends off for that period of time. And they saw improvements in angiogenesis, well, new blood vessels in your brain. And they could see this on MRI imaging. And they saw new blood vessels around your heart and VO2 max went up, which is how much oxygen you can utilize every second, right? So, and then they also saw that this is the erectile dysfunction study that you had more blood vessels in your genital region. So you could get better erections. And at the same time, you, your telomere length went up. And these are these, these tips of your chromosomes that get smaller as we get, as we get older and are a sign of aging. So these also extended, which is very other, very few other uh, treatments that we know of that can really extend telomere length. And then the last thing they saw was senescent cells. And these are these cells that accumulate as we get older often called zombie cells. People can look up zombie cells and that's a senescent cell. These are non-dividing inflammatory types of cells and hyperbaric therapy seemed to downregulate or decrease the number of these cells in the body. It wasn't clear if they were just dying as they were supposed to in the sense that sometimes when, when the way the body is supposed to work, as you know, uh, Gabrielle, is that like you're supposed to, if a cell doesn't work anymore, the body is supposed to have these mechanisms that say, oh shit, this is not working. Let's kill this cell. I hope I can curse. <laughs> Oh, uh, you would not be the first. I, I, I'm, I'm sure if you've had Navy SEALs <laughs> uh, on you. Um, unfortunately. Yeah. No, just kidding. Sorry, guys. <laughs> just kidding. Yeah. I would like to thank one of the sponsors of the show, and that's First Form. We spoke about protein and how being protein forward is really important for maintaining body composition. This, again, is essential in any nutrition plan for health and thriving which, you know, I, I believe that we've really gotten wrong in the space of health and prioritizing protein can be hard. I, I understand. How are you going to do that? You're going to do it by going to First Form Formula One Natural Protein Powder. I've been working with this company since 2018. You can go to firstform.com slash Dr. Lion. They will ship free to you, U.S. shipping. Also, they have an incredible array of protein bars. If you're in a hurry, if you're only eating two meals a day and then either a shake or some kind of snack, this is a great way to add in a protein bar. They have chocolate pretzel, which is pretty amazing, peanut butter, you name it, birthday cake. It is a great way to stay on track, great products and very important to get your protein intake. Do not sacrifice that by becoming so busy, which we all are. Go to firstform.com slash Dr. Lion. Um, so we know that senescent cells accumulate and then the body is either supposed to get rid of them um, 
as it's supposed to, that's what happens when we're younger. Or maybe what hyperbaric therapy might do is actually regenerate these cells from the ground up because we're getting it more oxygen. We're helping them produce the ability to make more energy more effectively. So this is without any other interventions, right? So this is just, you know, the regular person that's coming off the street in Israel. They're not as overweight as they are here, but they're overweight there too. And just doing that. Now, in my experience, you can shorten that dramatically. And I have only empiric evidence now, but I'm working on more evidence and we can talk about this. But in the, my sense, it's sort of like a minimal viable product. Like what's your MVP if you're doing everything else that you're optimizing, right? So you're optimizing your diet, your lifestyle, your supplements, you're, you're, you're getting your data, you're working with people, you know, all those kinds of things. And you can significantly decrease that. So I got so excited by that study because I was like, they did nothing but just go into a hyperbaric chamber. I can do so much better than that. Right, with the people that I work yeah. with. Yeah. Um, there is a hard chamber, soft chamber. Mm -hmm. How do you determine um, which one should someone use? Right. Because it, it, right now, hyperbarics, it's not really, the frequency of use seems to be soft chambers as, unless they are diabetic, brain injury, where they're really going for intensive medical right. treatment. Have, have you found that? And when is there a place for soft chamber versus a hard chamber? Right, so I used to be only in the medical grade hyperbaric chamber camp for a long time. This I know, now I guess yeah. this is you, this has changed. But this has changed over the years because I've realized, and there was actually some studies that were done in, in veterans that looked at one pressure at a very deep pressure and a very mild pressure that you can find in a soft chamber and everybody got better. So the, in a study design, that means that the chamber didn't work. But these are people with stable brain injury for over a year. These people don't get better. You know this as well. Like once you've had a brain injury for over a year, it's very difficult for you to recover from that. And everybody got better. And so of course, there's study designs and there's all these issues that we don't have to talk about. But when you see something like that, you know something's going on. And then there, I have a colleague that has done a decent amount of work looking at spec scans, which is a type of brain image that you can take a look at blood flow in the brain, kind of like an MRI, but kind of more of a rudimentary type of MRI. It's been around longer, as you know. And so they've noticed that you can get increased blood flow in the brain at these milder pressures. And we're relatively convinced, I'm actually very convinced now, that the milder pressures that you can get in, in a mild unit are actually very good for neurocognitive optimization. Really? And that's for brain injury, that's for brain health, and then also for things like jet lag. It's really good for that too. I find, like I've had a number of high performers over the years that have chambers in their homes, and they just tell me that they just were on an airplane, and they were at pressurized to 8,000 feet, which is what you're pressurized on an airplane. They get into their hyperbaric chamber when they get home, and like their jet lag goes away. And that's because when you're at 8,000 feet, you're getting 16% oxygen. You're not getting 21% oxygen as you are at sea level. And then you go into the airplane and then you come off the airplane. That's one of the reasons why you get jet lag. So I found over the years that these mild units are really great for the way I practice, actually, which Do is- Do you uh, use a, a Yeah, chamber? I have one in my house, yeah. Gosh, yeah, I think from we my might company. have to get yeah. one. Yeah, I mean, it's fantastic because it's something that you can integrate within your lifestyle, right? What about because for children? So in kids, there's like a whole spectrum of ways that you can use hyperbaric therapy. Is it yeah. beneficial? Because their, it their be. brain is growing. They don't yeah. typically have any of the same issues. So it, we don't typically use the chambers for optimization strategies in children, right? Because it's not something we typically think of. And most of the time, the way I've used the chambers in kids is for kids with brain injury, kids with the, on the spectrum, the autistic spectrum, and kids with even you know brain injuries from uh, from childbirth even, uh, like cerebral palsy, et cetera. There's actually some relatively good studies in the low pressure world, so in the environments that you could get in a, in a soft chamber, for example. So, but the thing about the soft chamber market is that it's very unregulated right now. And so over the last couple of years, it's been kind of like the wild west. Is there a reason why it's unregulated? Because it's not a medical grade device yet? Right, so there's only one indication for that particular type of chamber that's medically approved, and that's acute mountain sickness. So this is somebody that goes up a mountain. Yeah, I've treated patients for acute mountain sickness. The best thing to do is put them in a chamber, these inflatable devices that you can travel with or be at a base camp, for example, and get them hyperoxygenated as fast as possible and it reverses the injury. So that's the only indication that's medically approved for using the, the mild, the soft-sided units. Everything else is off-label, so not covered by insurance. And now I get calls every week from people that get these chambers in their house and they have no idea how to use them. And they've been using them every day without days off for like years and then typically get into problems. Or they have no idea what their protocol what should be. What kind of problems? Well, the challenge with hyperbaric therapy is that it's not benign. You're getting more oxygen in circulation. You're creating what I, I talked about in the beginning, 
reactive oxygen species. And so for the most part, even in a mild unit, you're gonna get that, but it's gonna be mild. But over time, if you're not, if you get depleted in antioxidants, if you're toxic, if you have other issues that come up, you can get too much oxidative stress. And so what you find is that over the long term in, in a hyperbaric protocol you, ha protocol, you have to worry about something called oxygen toxicity. And this is when the, the brain or the body gets too much oxygen and gets reactive oxygen species build up, and then you can have manifestations of that. It could be anything from something mild. So for example, the most common thing I see is that you're getting better, but you've been using a chamber for a long period of time, and then all of a sudden you start getting worse again. Like you start feeling groggy, your brain injury is feeling worse again, then that's usually that you've gotten too much oxygen. So. We know this, and this is actually something that you probably trained as, as well as I did in ICUs. We were worried about people getting too much oxygen for too long a period of time because it can injure people's lungs. But that's in people that are getting 24 hours a day, high oxygen e exposures with extra pressure in their lungs, something to help them ventilate if they're on a ventilator, for example. So it's very rare, but it's something that's important to think about when you're looking how you're going to optimize somebody in a hyperbaric environment. Especially because it's so unregulated, people right. could go in at any time and I, there's a lot of local places. Right, and that's and the challenge no I find. Yeah, is that yeah. people go to these places, they don't have protocols and then they don't know what they're doing. And you know, in a mild unit, it's very difficult to hurt yourself, thankfully, but it's possible. But well, in, what would a good protocol be? So for example, if so, we yeah, built so it a depends. picture. So for me, it depends on kind of what somebody's goals are in the sense that if, if, and what access they have, right? If they have access to a mild unit, I have a certain battery of protocols that I'll use for that. If they have access to a medical grade unit, I'll have a certain cadre of protocols for that as well. So it really depends. So, But for most people that are getting chambers in their homes now, um, I've really been emphasizing the need to do this in an integrated way, right? In a medical grade unit, you also would benefit from doing that, absolutely. But especially if you're looking to get systemic benefit in a mild unit in your home, then you're thinking about, well, how am I optimizing blood flow? How am I oxidating, uh, uh, how, am I, um, how am I doing the best to detoxify after I get out of the chamber? How am I making sure that I'm utilizing this chamber in a way that's integrated with the rest of my life? In a medical grade unit, it's still important, but if you're also getting systemic benefit there as well already because you're going to deeper pressures. So this is where I'm, I'm always, do not get into the chamber. We're, we're like, let's talk about optimizing your health first. Uh, okay, I wanna hear. So they before they get into the chamber, what should they do? So it depends on where they're going and where, they, where, they, where they're starting and where they wanna go. But in general, if somebody's pretty well optimized already, then I talk about some supplements, some dietary changes, some other things that might help the hyperbaric environment work better. And that could be something like increasing blood flow. So there's simple things like taking a supplement like L-arginine or CoQ10. Please don't do this without doctor's advice, please, anybody that's listening. But these are the ideas of, of some things that you could do. So I, I'll talk about niacin, arginine, CoQ10. And I, I felt so passionate about this that I really wanted a way for people to be able to access the work that I do. And so that some of the platforms that I have are, are starting to work on how you can integrate some of this stuff in your own environment and your own work and your own lifestyle and things as well. So that's what I felt really comfortable in that frame. And when I talk to people, that's what I always talk about. So like, so I can talk about a supplement, but then I'm like, well, I'm like, what about technology? You can use low level light therapy. Like you can use red light before you go into the chamber, because if you use red light, you're going to dilate blood vessels. You're going to help with energy production. And then you can also use supplements like methylene blue, for example. I want right? to talk about yeah. methylene blue. And then, yeah. but then you can go in the chamber and in, in a mild unit, you can actually go in there with things that are not flammable and you can go in there and you can use them. And so you can do you, your phone's fine usually as well. And then I, you can do meditations in there. You can do basic things inside the chamber to help optimize what you're doing. So like if you're if you have mild cognitive impairment, when you're under high oxygen conditions, even if you don't have mild cognitive impairment, but it's more important if you do, we know that your multitasking ability goes up in a hyperbaric environment. So I've done podcasts from my chamber before. So I've done- Hey, that. where's Dr. Scott? Oh, you know, he's just hanging out in the chamber. I was gonna do mine from, uh, do our podcast from the chamber, but I thought it'd be hard for me to lug to your yeah, that would place be, today. Yeah. And it'd be that'd weird be if I was in a chamber while you were here talking. My kids would totally be <laughs> in that. Yeah, it would be interesting. but you want to utilize that environment to, to do the work that you want or the goals that you're trying to achieve. And then after you get out of the chamber, you actually have about 30 minutes when that oxygen's still in your system. And you can actually utilize that to do more things that require oxygen carrying capacity, like your exercise, for example. And so you can actually get more work done and make more gains that way. Or you can take That's that time. That's pretty incredible. I know. Does it matter what kind of exercise? 
the only thing is is just the practicality of it, right? Because you've just been sitting or for in the chamber for sixty or ninety minutes, you can't immediately go run a marathon. I've thought about this over the, over the years. Could I mean, you, admit you could, you, but I don't recommend yeah. it. I thought about this over the years because I have a lot of cyclist friends, and they're like, "Well, maybe if we bring a chamber to the race." get in the chamber, and then get on the bike. It's an interesting idea. It's an idea, but it's not easy to do in practicalities because you're sitting in the chamber, you're not warming up for that time frame, right? You're in a chamber. But you could, could you not? Do you If the chamber is big enough, I guess. And if you if you have like a larger chamber, and actually there are, there are a couple of athletes that will bring hyperbaric chambers with them to places. There's uh, Djokovic, the tennis player, who will bring medical grade hyperbaric chambers to where he plays. And I actually, my, my friend in Australia is the guy that uh, set him up for all that many years ago. So you can do it, but it's it's harder to do in practicality. For the most part, what people will do after they get out of the chamber is try to help the detoxification process of revving up the system to make more energy. And Sauna is the most common okay. that I like people to do. Cold is also good. I don't like people doing cold before, but cold afterwards. Because it constricts... Well, Blood cold vessels, constricts or? and then it dilates like crazy. So hypothetically, it would be great to go in the chamber after you're dilated like crazy because you're going to get more oxygen to your periphery. But nobody wants to sit in the chamber after being in right. cold. I've tried this. Yeah, exactly. Believe me, I tried it myself. Toughen up, people. Toughen <laughs> I up. I tried it myself. So my favorite protocol, I call it my optimal, optimal focus protocol, is... You do some of the things to help optimize blood flow before you go into the chamber. You do 30 minutes, just 30 minutes in the chamber, and then you go and do something cold, a shower, an ice bath, cryo. Do you, you do care it. about the temperature of coldness? Whatever is comfortable for people. Like I don't, I'm not a stickler that it needs to be 32.5 degrees. I think, if it may, I think anything below 50 degrees is probably good for most people. I used to be more of a cryo guy. Now I'm more of an ice bath guy. I mean, like everybody else these days. But, uh, but what I, I, even a cold shower can work to help just constrict down and then then dilate after you go into constriction of being in the cold. So that's my favorite protocol. That's the one that I usually recommend people if they have access to these things. If you have access to a cold shower. So for my routine, if I'm going to do something just to give me a little bit more pep, it'll be take something 30 minutes before I go into the chamber. Usually something like like meth, arginine, like, or, or like arginine or methylene blue is my co most common actually. Which most people don't know about methylene blue. I mean, oh yeah, yeah, yeah. We can talk about that. Yeah, and then I'll go into the chamber for thirty minutes. I'll either do a nap, a meditation, and then I'll go into the cold. But do for, you napitate? Napitate. That's which cute. Which is napping and oh no, I do that all the time. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, okay. the, the meditation that turns into a nap, of that's course. more common for me I'm an, before I'm I go home. I'm an expert at that. Yeah, before I, I get into my car and go home to, to be at the house. and Unless you, you sit know. with a toddler. Have you, so you have four children. I do have four kids, yeah. Um, do you, and what's the oldest is how old? So my oldest is 11. But your youngest is like three, right? He's five. Oh, so five. I have 11, nine, seven, and five. I, I don't want to get off topic, but. Uh, that's a lot of kids <laughs> and that's a lot of little kids all at one time and when you are trying to nap or meditate when you sit down and you try to watch a movie with them d did your kids like every five seconds what's happening why is that happening did that ever happen I immediately to you? fall asleep I immediately fall asleep when I sit down with my children wait. Oh, immediately <laughs> how is that possible yeah. wait what are you yeah. doing what yeah. are you doing mom mom I know but they wake me up every five minutes right and but the way five I meditate is, is, in, is in the car <laughs> okay and the, smart the, that's, man so that, that, my, that's what was my office for when they were really young that's that was my office for sure I did my, all my zoom calls my, some podcasts in my car I mean you know whatever, whatever needed to happen happened in the car for a long time and but that's the meditate into nap thing that you're talking about. So but, I, I hate yeah. to uh, no, okay. digress, but yeah, it's, so, yeah, so it's, it's nice to know that you have four children and are doing all this stuff. And, you know, you're a physician, right. a board certified physician who actually obviously saw the darker side of medicine. And when I say darker side, I mean all the things that go, go wrong, very disease focused. And right. although you did have a more holistic perspective growing up because of right. your father as a chiropractor, you now were, you did go the traditional medical route, which I really admire. I think it's very important to get a solid baseline understanding of what can go wrong before you can actually understand what goes right. Um, and we're just bringing people up to speed in terms of the protocol that you would do personally. You would get in there for 30 minutes, Easy, quick protocol. nap, yeah. meditate. But I do my longer protocols too. And this is for more of the optimization strategies. That's my one-off session for a little cognitive boost. I have my muscle recovery sessions that I do. And then I work with people and myself, because I have a chamber at the house, for on the mild units to do what I would call protocol and maintenance phase hyperbaric therapy. So if you have a chamber, you can do protocols where you're going in Monday through Friday, five days a week for a month. 
and then after that you go in on uh, 16 to 90 minutes typically and then then be, and after that you go and do maintenance you're going three times a week ish kind of thing and same 16 to, 16 to 90 minutes sometimes 30 minutes though like the chamber that would be protocol. incredible yeah that's, that's typically doable. That's, that's doable. i think that's doable for most people that you know have access to a chamber but again, it depends on what your goals are. But that's, and then I do those protocols periodically depending on what people need, which is that Monday through Friday. Uh, and then on the systemic side, so if you have access to a medical grade chamber, that's when you can do the Israeli protocol, but less of it if you're optimizing your health in the other ways that we're describing, right? So for me, that means 20 sessions typically is sort of your minimum number where you see that epigenetic shift that we were discussing earlier. So if someone, so if you are a military operator or someone who is, uh, played sports, had concussions. Right. I, I know that. Um, I mean, that would would uh, would that be an indication? Yeah. For so minimum. Too? Yeah, minimum at least twenty. But for most of those indications, concussions, uh, stroke, people that have had infections or have infections currently, uh, even people on dementia, et cetera. Like you, you're really thinking about at least 20, but usually like 30 to 40 sessions is your minimum. And then from there, even more sometimes as well, sometimes up to 60, 80, and then sometimes even more than that over time. So what I find is that, and this is not talked about a lot in the hyperbaric world, is that there is often an indication for what I would call maintenance hyperbaric therapy. So for people that have no medical issues that want to continue to optimize, and then also people that do have medical conditions that are not going to fully heal. How long does the... So you do a treatment, it, it technically lasts 30 minutes, so that the blood flow increase right. lasts 30 minutes. Right. But in terms of what actually happens over a period of time, you, know, you talked about kind of um, new blood vessel growth, those kinds of things. Right. So there are lasting benefits, but that takes time to build exactly. up to those, exactly. aside from the acute benefit, which would be increased blood flow. Right. Perfectly said, because one, you're getting in the chamber and an acute infusion of hyperbaric therapy or of oxygen is going to rev up the body's healing process, get more oxygen in the tissue, but it's only going to be temporary. Every session you go, it's going to be in for 30 minutes and then it's going to be gone. You're going to get some shifts. You're going to get some revving up of the whole body, but it's not going to be a permanent shift. But that could be really only all you need if it's an acute injury. But if it's a long-term issue. Like an old injury. Right. If it's a long issue. So the way I like to think about this is that if you have a brain injury, for example, you have an area of your brain that's not functioning well. And you have an area like sort of in the middle of that tissue that's really, really bad, not getting any blood flow at all. But around that area, there's more blood flow that's getting there, but maybe just not enough to keep that tissue healthy. So what we can do in a hyperbaric chamber after about 20 sessions, 30, 40 sessions, is that we, we, we're rebuilding the architecture of that tissue. We're getting new blood vessels to that tissue. We're getting new stem cells to that area. We're getting the, the inflammatory cascades that are related to a chronic injury to go down, to be down-regulated. So some of these, they're called cytokines or these chemical messengers and something like TNF-alpha and others that people know about. So and we know that hyperbaric therapy, actually not in the brain injury world, but actually in the inflammatory bowel disease world, has been shown to be as powerful as a steroid medication at decreasing inflammation. So it's a very powerful acute tool, but over the long term, the key really is to shift that whole architecture. When I give these talks, I often talk about like rebuilding the architecture of a building. You have the scaffolding around it. So it's rebuilding that scaffolding that you need for the tissue to be healthy, and that's what we can do in the chamber as long as you have all of the machinery available for you to do that. Can you make connective tissue? Can you make energy? If you can't, then everything that we're going to do is not gonna be as optimal as it would be if you were optimizing that foundation first. How can someone, for, from a practical aspect, how can someone vet a good soft chamber? So if we were to say, okay, this is how much it should cost. If you don't have one of the diagnoses for a hard chamber, you're not gonna get it covered under insurance. Right. And if there are any military military operators out there, you can come talk to me. We will help right. arrange that for you. Right. But um, for the, the the lay person, how can they vet a good chamber? How much should it cost? Should they right. buy one? Should they rent it? Is there going to be you know like with the red light therapy when yeah. they when those panels came out, they were super expensive. You right. know, you're talking about five grand for a panel now. You're looking at maybe twenty five hundred, so half the the right. price. So what yes. how, what do you tell people? What do yeah. they? So you'll never be able to get your soft chamber covered by insurance, no matter what your indication is. Even if you've had an indication that's covered by medical insurance, they're not going to pay for your home chamber because all the medical indications are covered technically in medical grade pressures, so two atmospheres or deeper. So that's number one. So it's going to be an out-of-pocket cost to buy a chamber. Now, when you're looking at the soft chamber market, there are a lot of chambers out there. There's ones that cost 
$4,000 and there's ones that cost $23,000. So a huge spectrum. And really what it comes down to in my world is that the technology is about the same, but it's about the longevity of the chamber, how long the chamber is going to last you, and also the services that are going to allow you to have the most benefit from that chamber over the long term. Plus, yeah, I guess the longevity of the chamber is is how long it's going to last you, right? And then, so that's that's one piece, and then the other piece is the service piece, right? In the sense of what other services are you getting from this hyperbaric chamber company that's going to allow you to get the right protocols, to know know the integrations, like to know more and have a, a, a larger sort of umbrella that can help you. And so that's what I've been trying to do with the company that I developed, which is we're a technology company. We've created software that helps people understand how people can optimize their experience in the chamber. So we do have, I don't really sell chambers. We have some demo chambers that are out there um, and that we're, we actually are interested in having more some additional demo people, like a small number of people that are interested in chambers with us just so that they can work on our technology. But in general, yeah, because, I, I, because my technology, the idea really is everything we d we've been discussing is like, what's your integrative plan here? What's your protocol? What are the services that you're that are giving you the ability to use a chamber over the long term? And so to the pricing point, there are rental options. And I have some resources through my websites and others that And we'll link everything for yeah. people. Um, and rental is a good option for a lot of people because that's a way you can get a sense of how the chamber is going to work with you. Is it going to work in your, in your lifestyle? Are you going to be able to use it? Are you seeing the results that you want to see? But my only caveat to that is if you just get a chamber and just go in it and don't know what you're doing, then unlikely you're going to see the benefits that you would see if you had more of a framework around so it. So you either A, need a physician who is championing that for you, yeah. or you need um, to work with a provider that knows what they're doing, or yeah. you need, need to work with a company. Right, a service that's a going service to help you. A service that can right. interface. Right, um, something that's going to give you a, a bit of a framework. I mean, I've done a lot of work over the last several years to give people an idea, I think, of what you can expect of going in a hyperbaric chamber. But I'm always looking at more technologies, more practices. I've been really interested in breath work recently and how breath work can really optimize your hyperbaric experience and also just optimize your life in general, of course. But the, the deal with the chamber is what it comes down to, I think, is that what's going to happen over the next several years is that you're going to see those prices come down because there's more people that have that are selling the chambers, and that's a good thing for everybody. Because the idea for me is I want as many people to get these things as possible, and then we can find out the best protocols as we scale in the software and other ways that people are using these technologies together. Because my deal is that people are getting more of these technologies in their house. They have their lights. They have their sauna. The hyperbaric chamber is not too far behind as far as I'm concerned. I, I agree with you. Yeah. I agree with you. Yeah. And so there's the early adopters, the people that have the wherewithal to be able to purchase these things, and there's resources for them now. But I don't want people to get uh, get bent out of shape because I think over the next five, ten years max, you're going to see these prices come down dramatically. And there's going to be rental options that are going to be reasonable, uh, I think, as well, where you're going to be able to get this in your home as well. But the key, again, it's not just get, getting, about getting the chamber. It's about it's about what are you doing inside that chamber as well? How are you optimizing? And not only with the chamber, how are you integrating your other technologies as well? So the deal for me is that whether you have a hyperbaric chamber or not, you should still find a way to integrate those technologies that you have in your in your house together. So if you have lights, if you have sauna, exercise equipment, if you have a cold tub, I mean, these are things that you should be able to find ways to optimize depending on your goals. So the software that we're developing, hopefully we'll be able to do that over time. But the idea initially is how you're going to get that hyperbaric experience to be as optimal as you can. So, but yeah, I think that's the thing is that the soft chamber market is just, it's everywhere. You can find a soft chamber for $4,000 on the computer right now, but I don't know if that's the best way to go because they're just going to sell you a chamber. There's going to be no warranty. You're not going to have any protocols. You're not going to have any support. And what are the companies that you'd recommend? So right now, I hesitate to say company names. What I would say is better is to do your research and to find people that you trust within the field, whether it's your provider. There's some providers that have chambers or that work with chamber companies. Um, my company does, as I said, sell some chambers, but our goal really is on the, on the technology side. But we are looking to work with a select group of people that are interested in getting some demo chambers with us and working on some of the technology side of things too. So if anybody's interested that's listening, uh, they can always reach out to me and we'll give some give some resources for that as well. Yeah. yeah, because if we can do that, my goal with the company that we're working with that I'm that I developed is how can I bridge that gap that's happening that's still out there. Yeah. So talk to me about methylene blue. Yeah. Uh, that's unique and most people don't know about it. What is it? How does it work? Yeah. So methylene blue 
has was actually the first drug that was registered with the FDA back in the 1890s. And it's really a, kind of an interesting story how I got involved. So we have a nonprofit company that's educating doctors on a foundational practice of health called Health Optimization Medicine. And we, as you, love helping doctors optimize and find ways to help their patients because there's only one or two of us. And we want to make sure that we can get other people in the framework that's really optimizing. And so we have a nonprofit. And then with the nonprofit, we created a for-profit company that's looking at the bottlenecks that we all face on the way on the path to optimizing our health. And one of the major bottlenecks that we all have these days is our mitochondria. And what is one of the most powerful mitochondrial enhancers in the world? Exercise. <laughs> Exercise, <laughs> of course, of course, um, that's really important. Exercise, muscle, is really important. Yeah, okay, yeah. Well, if you don't want to exercise, no, no. It, while exercising, <laughs> because who doesn't? Who wants to exercise these days? Come on. I do. <laughs> so do I. Oh my goodness. Um, you just lift my children, right? That's what I do. Uh, but so methylene blue is a fantastic m mitochondrial enhancer. What was it at first FDA approved for? So it was first approved to treat malaria, because at high doses of methylene blue, which would be what. It's usually greater than about two milligrams per kilogram. Yeah, yeah, that's and a high dose. It's a pretty high dose, yeah. But even a little bit lower than that, it's being used in some of the Lyme co-infections now, like Bartonella, for example. But what it was first used before there was antibiotics or antivirals or antifungals or antiprotozoals was as an anti-infective. And up until World War II, methylene blue was used as the primary anti-infective. In fact, there's orally songs. Orally or topically? Uh, orally, orally, yeah. And so it was used, and it was there were songs that were sung in the military about turning your pee blue because of taking methylene blue. Because methylene blue concentrates in your urine when you take it, and so it will turn your urine a shade of blue, depending on your hydration and status. And your tongue. And your tongue, depending on how you take it, right. So, and, and so methylene blue was initially used in that capacity. And then in the 1950s, it was found out that it was there was properties of it that helped with neurotransmitter release. So it almost worked like what's called a monoamine oxidase inhibitor. So it helped release serotonin and dopamine. And so the first antipsychotic drugs were derived from methylene blue. Yeah. And then it was at that same time that they were starting to use it in laboratory staining. And where does it stain in your cell? It stains in your mitochondria. And your mitochondria are people classically know people uh, people in the science field hate this term but in the regular world it's known as the powerhouse of your body right it makes all your energy right and so the way that we make energy is related to this something called the electron transport chain this chain of complexes and makes energy whatever it doesn't matter but methylene blue it does matter but you know what i mean no, actually exercise helps with that too so anyway so anyway so methylene blue helps this your mitochondria work better it helps with energy production and it does this in about four different ways and also interestingly and this is what actually got me on the hyperbaric side is that it helps change the the way red blood cells dump off oxygen into the tissue al allowing more oxygen to be taken off each of those red blood cells per red blood cell to get more oxygen to help with work to make more energy which is super interesting so, so does methylene blue enhance exercise so there's been no studies on this, which is super interesting. But what I think happens is that you're, and I've been working with a number of athletes, small and of one kinds of things so far, but ways to use methylene blue to help with enhancing with endurance for that reason. We know it helps with altitude. We know it helps with um, with mitochondrial function in general. And, that's, and, and the, the major way that's been studied so far has been in cognitive impairment types of models. So there's a researcher, his name is Dr. Francisco Gonzalez Lima, and he's done a lot of work at the University of Texas, Austin, where his major thing is Alzheimer's and looking at Alzheimer's as a blood flow issue and using methylene blue as a way to enhance mitochondrial function in the brain to reverse that kind of injury. And so he's been having some really amazing work that he's done in animals. So he's, they're starting to do some work in humans as well. So the way I think methylene blue is as a way to mitochondrial enhance and also as a way to continue to help with energy production, even if there's not a mu as much oxygen available, interestingly enough, because it works in low oxygen settings as well, because it's helping with the whole mitochondrial electron transport chain work better. So the way I use methylene blue for myself is as a nootropic, as a way to help with my brain function. And the way that I and the company that I work with have used it in a framework to help with brain function that way. But it also helps with fully mitochondrial enhancement. Because Are the dosing, do so what would yeah. the dose be for a neurotropic versus yeah. for sustained use for mitochondria and then you know I, I don't want to forget this i'm curious as to when anything concentrates in the urine yeah. is that bladder protective is that 
you right. know, are there components to that which may be good, may not be good? Yes, yeah, so they, they used to use it for urinary tract infections specifically because it concentrates in the urine. There's no indication of anything bad that happens as a result of it being in there. And what was the other question you asked me? The other question was the dosing in terms of a neurotropic dosing. Yeah. What kind of, what would that dose be? Yes, yeah, so the dose that's been mostly studied in the mild cognitive impairment world is about 16 milligrams of methylene blue. And so this is, the big thing about methylene blue that people get scared of is that it's also used in fish tank cleaner. And so there is a number of, of articles that were published about my company and others that are like us telling people that we were giving people fish tank cleaner to drink you know, as a way to optimize their health and longevity. It's actually quite funny. You know, we knew we made it when we had, you know, flashy headlines about fish tank cleaner. Yeah. So fish tank cleaner does have about 2% methylene blue, and it's not pharmaceutical grade. It's not for human consumption. It has a lot of impurities and heavy metals and things like that. But it still uses an anti-infective in fish tank cleaners. And so it's it's something that I always tell people that methylene blue is, it's, it's really important you get a good source of this stuff because there are poor sources of it everywhere you look. It's kind of like the ivermectin conversation where like you get horse dewormer or you get it from a prescribed physician, right? And so people are going to the ER because they were taking it from their horses. They weren't getting issues if they were taking it from like their doctor that prescribed it. It's the same thing with methylene blue, which and methylene blue falls into an interesting category because it's it can be prescribed still. It's still used in ER settings for methahemoglobinuria, right? methahemoglobinemia, excuse me, which is basically like carbon monoxide poisoning, you know? So, and it can help because it helps with oxygen, helps with energy production, regardless of whether your red blood cells are doing a good job giving oxygen to your cells or not. So it's very versatile, but the dosing for nootropic capacity is somewhere around the 16 milligram mark. For infection, it's higher. Um, I have colleagues of mine that are using 25 to 50 milligrams of methylene blue twice daily for things like Babesia, for example. And, and the I'm, side yeah. effects to that? So the side effects at higher doses really don't start until you get to about above two milligrams per kilogram. Because what's interesting about methylene blue, it's also an antioxidant. It also helps mop up electrons and reactive oxygen species. But at higher doses, about uh, definitely at over four milligrams per kilogram, it actually becomes the opposite. And it's been used for this reason in actually acute settings like for high, for really bad infections and also for sepsis because it causes vasoconstriction. It constricts down blood vessels. So it's it's kind of one of those dose response curves kinds of things in the sense that lower doses optimizes mitochondria, decreases inflammation, helps with antioxidant capacity. And at the higher doses, it has the opposite effect actually. So, and so that there's a, but there's a middle, middle area that can be help, very helpful and not detrimental as well. And who should take the neurotropic? So would it be, so we use, I use a lot of modafinil in the yeah. practice. Um, would you combine this, the methylene blue? Do you do you personally take 16 milligrams a day, or is it uh, right. very uh, for a specific task? How how long does it last? So methylene blue is so the when you depending on how you take it, it can last about if you take it in an IV, which people do now, it's obviously going to be immediate and last a very short period of time. In an oral formulation, you're usually talking about about four to six hours. And for me, what I do, and I typically use it as something that's helping with mitochondrial optimization over the long term. So it's not something that you, you can use things that are more targeted, like that have what I would do is like more stimulants related to like getting more targeted things to like, like modafinil is a good, good, good idea. Like in the sense that like, if you have something that's optimizing your mitochondria and at the same time, you're giving something that's kind of stimulating you to, to be more wakeful and more on point, then it's a fantastic combination, for example. Yeah. So no contraindications. You can methylene blue in at a sixty milligram dose is easily tolerated. Yeah, yeah. So there are a couple things. Like, so it works as a mild MAOI inhibitor. So you don't want to be on antidepressants or anything that's going to be selectively getting more serotonin in your mm -hmm. in your synaptic space. So SSRIs, some of the newer antidepressants that also have serotonin reuptake. Um, and if you're a psychedelic person, you got to watch out for those because your mushrooms, your LSD, your DMT, if you're doing like in, in traditional ceremonies, also um, increases serotonin in the synapse as well. So, so yeah, you got to be, be careful there. But overall, um, there's very other, and you don't want to be pregnant or breastfeeding. You know this. We talked about this before. Yeah. Yeah, that happened to me for about two years. So, but we, but I, we also have a product that, that includes caffeine and nicotine along with the methylene blue. And Which that's I think yeah. that idea is phenomenal. Um, people have a, a negative, there's a negative connotation with nicotine, negative connotation with caffeine, but right. when used appropriately, both are great for brain function, brain, even brain health, not. Yeah, nicotine gets a really bad rap yeah, because of, of obvious reasons and for, for real reasons, of course. But if you don't vape or smoke nicotine, 
there's no studies that show that it's really that bad for you, especially if you're using low doses and you're doing it in more of a targeted way. There's actually studies in cognitive impairment and Alzheimer's disease. As it relates to improvement. Yes. 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 And so cognition, focus, verbal fluidity, all nicotine has shown to be a benefit for. So, and so if you're using a low dose of it and you're not vaping or smoking it and you're using it more of in a targeted way, it, it can be very beneficial. And Whether so, it's, know. and and also when we're talking about chewing tobacco, we're not talking about chewing tobacco, we're talking about nicotine yeah. pouches or we're talking about nicotine gum or a right. lozenge. Nicotine itself. Yes. Yeah, nicotine itself. Like the the actual, because the challenge with a lot of nicotine products, the, the vaping products, the, the pouches even, or even the... Uh, the, the cigarettes, obviously, is you have a lot of additives in these products, and these additives make them more addictive, and that's what they've bred into these products over years to make you more addicted to the instant hit of nicotine. So I think nicotine's great. I think caffeine's great, but these things have to be used in the context of the person and, and of you. So they're stimulants, and so you, do you want to be using stimulants every day? Probably not if you can avoid it. You know, probably something that you want. If you do need stimulants every day, it could mean that you need some more optimization strategies. You need more uh, chamber or, or, therapy. or sleep. You need more sleep. You need more hydration. Or you need to be doing more things on your optimization strategies, right? In the sense of optimizing vitamins, minerals, and nutrients and your gut health and all those kinds of things that nobody wants to do because they take time and they're, they're long term. And it takes you know, months or years as opposed to taking something that's going to make you feel good for four to six hours. So. Mm -hmm. So I think of methylene blue as this foundational way of improving mitochondrial support from a supplement perspective. I mean, there's obviously lots of great ways to optimize mitochondrial health that don't require supplements and exercise is probably your best one, two, three, four, and five of those kinds of things. And we know that from studies on Alzheimer's and cognitive impairment and things. But I do feel like methylene blue specifically is going to be one of those things that we're going to see over the next five years significantly Im impact the world of supplements and how it's working in this world. And I'm already seeing this. I mean, the amount of interest, especially in the post-COVID world that we are in kind of now, the post-COVID patients that I work with, the brain fog, the fatigue, you give them methylene blue, a lot of times this gets better. And I mean, the, the company doesn't make any claims like that, but like in my clinic and the way I'm working with people, I see it. I give them, I give them, I give them methylene blue before they get into the chamber and they do better and, or they don't get in the chamber at all and they do the methylene blue and they also feel better too. So my sense is that this is one of those things like oxygen that had a lot of utility. So, and it's going to be interesting to see what you're on to next. So do you, okay. So you've yeah. got the hyperbaric, yep. the methylene blue. Is there something that has now the, a third thing that's mm -hmm. really piqued your interest that maybe you're not so sure of that is mm -hmm. one thing Dr. Scott and I share in common is we really want to see people be the best version of themselves. And in order to do that effectively as a physician, we always look at blood work, as uh, Dr. Scott spoke about, as I speak about quite frequently. The way in which we can do that is one of the sponsors of the show. We'd like to thank them for making this available to you. And that's insidetracker.com slash Dr. Lyon. You can go ahead and do this for 20% off. You can find out what your blood levels look like, your metabolomics, a lot of what Dr. Scott was talking about, baseline vitamins, minerals, hormones, all of it. It was created by scientists in aging, genetics, and biometrics. Inside Tracker really allows for personal empowerment. You can get a daily action plan. You can get personalized guidance on exercise, nutrition, even supplementation. Of course, speak with your physician about this. You can add inner age 2.0 to any plan to take a look at your true biological age, which by the way, mine is 29. And for a limited time only, get 20% off the entire Inside Tracker store. Just go to insidetracker.com forward slash Dr. Lyon. Is there anything yeah. you can't talk about well, it yet? I can, I think, it, and but I, I can do it from the clinical side. Okay, which is, can I can I say yeah, something here? Yeah. This is what I found with all experts in their field, yeah. all individuals who are pioneering. They have the foundational thing that they're known for. They have that's what gets them in the door. They have the next level of thing that they've already jumped to, right? Yeah. The, okay, so what is the interface between A and B, and then? 
there's always something else. They're always thinking about what is the next interesting, he's busted, <laughs> what, is, what is the next interesting avenue um, yeah. that, that you can, I, I'm sure that you've got it. Yeah, I do. Okay, well, okay, so, all right, you, can, so, you can talk about it in a very nebulous way. But. No, I, I, because I think it's important. And it is something that people have learned a lot about over the last couple of years. And it's not news for most people, but psychedelics are changing the world. And so, but my interest in this world is on especially the brain and how psychedelics work in a way that actually improve brain function. They improve synaptogenesis, the way the, the, the nerves uh, connect to each other. They improve what's called dendrites, the, the branches of each of these things that are working together. And I've been seeing people with diseases, conditions like ALS, for example, which is a terrible disease, uh, working with psychedelics and seeing these fantastic benefits of neurogenesis, of making new neurons and having these conditions that are terrible vastly not regress but stop in the progression and i'm like and a lot of what they're doing is working in these in this world and so i'm really interested to see how this all goes i mean i think it's great and fantastic that things like mdma and psilocybin are coming out for ptsd and traumatic brain injury and, and refractory depression uh, but and even on the let's call it the recreational side where people are using it for mood enhancement but i think the key here and this is where I'm likely going in the future is is understanding how this work work this work this world works with my work with the work that I've been doing and how it integrates and how people are already doing this some of my clients are already using some of these things and I'm seeing how the shift is dramatic I mean think about for example like for ketamine for example this is something that was used as an anesthetic we know it's now FDA approved for refractory depression it's been used in Kaiser hospitals on the west coast it's resetting your brain and so if you're doing something that's resetting your brain and also working in the ways that I've described and then using something like oxygen therapy at the same time, like what are the capacities to do this? So this is my frontier right now, which is how you can, how we're going to leverage the work that's being done in the work of what we call not psychedelics, but psychoplastogens. This is a word that's now being used more in the literature. And a colleague of mine, his name is Dr. Ted Atricoso. He's a brilliant guy that I work with, and he does have a lot of, he, he's the guy that started the nonprofit and the health optimization medicine framework that I use. The psychoplastogens are really where things are going in the sense of how you're using these tools, these molecules, these plants, both some synthetic, some from plants, to really change our physiology from the inside out and, you know, make whole again a lot of people that haven't been for such a long time. So I'm very excited about all that. I don't know where it's all gonna go, but for me, I'm always an integrator. So I'm like, well, how can you integrate this with this and, and get this together with this? And then and then how does that synergize together? And so I, that's where I'm excited for. I'm really excited, yeah. Well, you know, uh, I'm just curious, what drives you? What is your why behind all this effort and energy you're putting forth in the world? It's a really good question. And I've obviously thought about this a lot over the years. And when I was a kid, I grew up the son of a chiropractor who loves, still loves, he's been practicing for 40 years, loves what he does. And he will go to work every day at five o'clock in the morning, come a day, come home every day at eight o'clock at night, maybe a couple of days earlier than that now, and love every minute of his day because he gets to see people, he gets to do what he, he loves, and he's doing all this work. And I got to see that. And I knew that when I was growing up that I, I loved the ability to help people too. I didn't want to work as hard as he did in the sense of he is a machine so, uh, and how he works and how he does things. But I also knew that I was able to connect with people very fast. It would take me 30 seconds to really connect to somebody. And then if I had that ability to shift them in, in a very short period of time, it always felt to me that, that my work, my passion was that ability and that, you know, that superpower to be able to do that with people. So I think my, my, my why really does come down to my sense that we are in this and you are in this too to, to move the needle on health, right? Move that needle just a little bit in the work that we do. And if we can do that, we can shift so much in that process. And so I see that in the individual work that I do. I see that in the nonprofit that we run. I see that in, uh, in, in even the products that we make in the sense of always giving the larger context. Yes, I have a product that has methylene blue in it, but I really don't care if you take it. I really opt, really, if you just optimize your health, that's the most important thing. This can help you along the way. And so that's how I talk about things, always in the context of, of I guess, what my why is. Like, I really want to see people 
be the best that they can, that know that they're, they have the, the innate ability to heal and to optimize and be the best that they can. And it's all in us. It's about, it's a meditation thing. It's not about getting more stuff. It's about shedding stuff away. So I, I'm, I'm big into that world. And, and it's something that I always try to remind myself. It's not about adding, it's about subtracting. And people don't realize that like you, you have kids, I have kids. Like our kids are perfect. They have no cares in the world until we give them cares to have in the world. Right? I don't so, know. Leo peed all over the wall today. <laughs> so yeah, there's but the yeah. basic stuff. But did he care? No. See, that's the thing, right? He would have peed on There me. was a wall yeah. and he peed, right? And so we, and the closest thing I think that you can get to be on psychedelics is to actually watch your children before you give them wants, needs, desires, except for the basic things, of course, like peeing, pooping, and pissing on walls. But anyway, except for the basic things, they are just like this vessel of just being open. And so I think about, it's nice to have children or be around kids sometimes just to have that ability to say, oh, that's how I used to be, right? And I used to go on the playground and just play for no particular reason, not because I wanted my mitochondria to feel better. It was just because I wanted to play, right? And so that's why it's nice to have kids in that way. And they were actually my first teacher, really. Yeah. Did they, Aside from my dad. Yeah. Do they influence? Is your dad still living? Yeah, he's still he's still, still practicing working. on Long Island. Wow, he's still got a large wellness center in in Northport and in New York where he lives and where I grew up, and. But aside from him, it was really the, my kids that did it, and you'll you'll resonate with this. It was the idea that I no longer had control, because they were in my life. They were crying. They were pissing on walls. They were they were they were having gigantic craps, and then I had to clean them and bathrooms and airports. I mean, these are things that you realize that there's more, I mean, obviously like there's, there's a lot of sides to that and it's challenging and I, I don't want to have little babies anymore. I'm happy to have older kids, but understanding that you're not in control of things anymore. It was my first realization. I think it was about that time that, and that was when I was actually getting into the optimal performance world, the biohacking world. I was doing a lot of stuff in LA and I was working with a lot of athletes and I was doing like professional stuff and it was like a lot of fun, but then I, then I had children. I was like, oh, I can't do all this stuff anymore. And I'm busy and like, oh, my kid's crying. And, but it was transformative because I was like, oh, well, this is about me. It's not about them. And then you realize that like everything that happens in this world is your response to it is your own. It has nothing to do with anything that's going on outside of you, yeah. other than, other, except if your life is in danger or something. But in general, if your kid's having a bad day, you get to respond however you choose. And that's what I teach my kids. It's like, you get to choose how you respond any minute of any, every day. You get to restart every day at any minute of every day. If you choose to, it's up to you. I love that. Actually, we had someone named uh, Jason Redman, who's a former SEAL, and he had horrific injuries, eight gunshots, mm -hmm. and 40-some uh, surgeries. Wow. A complete right side of his face torn off. And he will tell you, it's all about how you choose to respond. Right. I mean, as a Navy SEAL, I mean, these guys have to, right? In the sense that you always have to have that, this is the challenge for all of us, you have to have that small window between how you interpret the world and how you respond instead of reacting. And it's so difficult to do, but it's it's not that difficult, as difficult as it sounds. Like if you just get a quick second, like, like a pinch, like something really small, a nanosecond, then you can change that, whole process mm. do you work on that with your patients i do but i mostly work on it with my kids to start and that's that's where i work on it mostly and the then big, with, but that's the biggest yeah. contribution yeah i mean with my, with my patients yeah. i i do a full spectrum of things i'm working on optimizing their health i'm getting them to a hyperbaric chamber and on the but the the beginning part i always focus on the meditative piece so i like look if you don't have a meditative practice try it and you don't have to be like that guru that sits without thoughts for, for three hours a day. It's all about, and this is Dr. Ted again, one of my colleagues and mentors, he's like, all you need to do is if you can just sit down, start with 30 seconds and observe your thoughts, watch them arise, and then watch them pass away. He's a heavy meditator. Yeah, yeah, in, in the Dzogchen tradition, which is a Buddhist tradition. And, and, he's, and it's called the Great Perfection, and a lot of it has to do with understanding that it's all these layers that we build up and then really our true selves is an illusion and but the things that we think of us as ourselves is all these layers that we built up over the years and you meditate yes yes it's i know an, you meditate in, in the chamber do you meditate yeah. 
twice a day, once a day. It depends. I'll do the, what did you call the nap and meditate together? The napitate. Med- the napitate. I'm I an do, expert I, napitator. I, I do that. Uh, I, I tend to not want to but need to meditate in the morning so that's the best time for me to meditate if i can because i'm the most awake i try to do about twice to three times a day yeah but usually twice is my average and it's not for long 10 minutes 15 minutes sometimes it's a guided meditation sometimes it's just a meditation with music sometimes i do it when i'm in my infrared sauna in the evening that's my other toy that i love to use in the evenings to help me wind down um and i know not everybody can afford one of those but if you can it's a great it's a great addition i know you have one too um, but for me, it's about trying to shift the psychology in myself. And then if, if I do that, then that's how I manifest it to others in the sense of, and then I give them tools along the way. I mean, not everybody's ready to meditate. Not everybody's ready to exercise. Not everybody's ready to change their diet or go into a hyperbaric chamber. Not, not everybody can, but there are th- certain things along that okay. spectrum. So I'm like, try methylene blue or don't. Uh, try walking around the block or don't. Try or drop and give me 50 push ups, and yes, yeah. do it. <laughs> so, you're tougher than me. So, I mean, in the sense that I, I know that there's going to be a way for me to find if I can just shift them a little bit, then I know I have an end. But by, you know? they, by the time they come to you, they're yeah. ready. They're not, yeah. most people they're probably are. Yeah. very well vetted, yeah. and they are. That's they, true. That's true. They're yeah. ready to go. That's true. Yeah. You know, I'm just curious in terms of nutrition therapy, yeah. diet. Do people, do you talk about that? Do you have a personal diet that you love? You know, you and I were talking prior to the recording, ketogenic diets, yeah. ketones, high fat, high protein, yeah. carbohydrates. Is yeah. there one in particular that has worked well for you? And we would both agree that it's very unique for the individual. Absolutely. So I like to do it at least based on some testing in the sense that somebody comes in, they have whatever diet they have. Okay. Okay. That's great. Let's see exactly what's happening cellularly to know. Is so this, you do uh, blood testing yeah, or, or what do you do? Yeah, blood, okay. urine, and stool typically. And so that's looking at what, what we talked about earlier, metabolomic testing. So looking at vitamins, minerals, and nutrients. And is there, do you use an ion test or what kind? Yeah, of- I usually use Genova. So the, the protocol and the platform that we use is typically Genova, something like the Nutrival, which is like the ions test. And so I use something like that. Then I'll use like a food sensitivity test. And we'll use a gut test, some sort of you know, like a GIFX from Genova or another type of stool test. That's the one I like the most. And then I'll get a comprehensive understanding of what's happening at that cellular level in the gut. And then I optimize and understand what their diet was before and what we need to do as a result of what their deficiencies and toxicities look like for the most part. But in general, for a long time, I was more on sort of the, because you and I both know the brain is made up of what, like 75% fat. So we know that to optimize brain health, we need good sources of fat in our diet. So I was, for a long time, I was more on the sort of ketogenic, modified Atkins kind of plan for most people. And I'm still there, although you and others have actually convinced me a little bit that I have been not as focused on protein as probably as I should have been um, initially when I was first starting out. And I think a lot of this has to do with a lot of the new research that's come out and that you've been very much a proponent of. And, and I think is very, especially from longevity, there was a lot of research that came out, what was it four or five years ago now that said that, you know, more protein, not only is it bad for your kidneys, this is still what doctors think, you know, and then even though we know that's not the case anymore. And then also it was very bad for cancer and longevity and all this other crap. But now we know all that stuff is likely not the case, but that's all relatively new in the sense that- And it takes years to undo, decades yeah. perhaps. Right. So. I'm more of the, of the vein now of trying to get good protein sources for most of my clients. And that's usually animal sources of protein if they'll allow it. If there's ethical issues, then we try as, as best we can with plant sources. But I, I like, look, the, the proof is in what I'm looking at on the testing. Like, you're doing great on a plant-based diet and your vitamin minerals, your oxidative stress levels are good. Fantastic. That's good for you, right? But if things look terrible, let's have a conversation here. Because unfortunately, my unhealthiest people that I see are usually vegans. Because, and I know they're doing their best and it's really hard to be a healthy vegan and some people can pull it off, but it's really difficult to do. And so, and the protein issue is, is really something that happens over a longer period of time. Yeah. And so, as you said, right? So for me personally, I'm more of a higher protein, moderate fat and like a lower carbohydrate kind of diet. And that's mostly what I have my clients doing these days too. And that, that's, a, that's a great starting point for yeah. anyone. Yeah. You and I were talking about additional ketones. Do you ever add any endogenous yeah. or exogenous ketones? Thank you. Yeah. So, so I know Dom Diagostino very well. We've I know you know, and he's such a great guy. And and so his work in the ketogenic diet and hyperbaric therapy was actually very transformative 
for the field of hyperbaric medicine. This is back in 2013 or 2014 when he published his first studies on hyperbaric therapy, a model of glioblastoma, brain cancer, and the ketogenic diet. And so since that time, he and I have been working together closely sometimes and other times more peripherally, but there is certainly evidence that ketones are protective for the brain. And so in people that have a higher risk for oxygen toxicity of the brain, especially, these are in patients that have uh, previous brain trauma. These are in patients that have uh, previous strokes or people that have cancer in the brain, for example. Um, I always think about how we can improve their uh, the ability for their brain to be more protected under higher oxygen conditions. So ketones can be very helpful there. Do you think that that helps survivability or just protection from the ex the challenge, the, the health challenge that they're going through? Right. So the, the first thing I think about is is protection. And the, the second thing I think about is survivability. So th from that early work, we do have some indications that hyperbaric therapy plus the ketogenic diet may be a synergistic approach when looking at cancer care. Now, what's awesome Brain about this- Brain cancer or all cancers? Well, the, the question is which cancers are better, which which are not. So we think it's solid tumor cancers and not sarcomas. We don't have a lot of research on sarcomas specifically. But we do think for most other types of solid tumors that hyperbaric therapy combined with the ketogenic diet, notwithstanding standard of care, mm -hmm. which means that you, you can do these things and also do standard of care conventional stuff, chemotherapy, radiation, surgery. Which I yeah. strongly, you know, yeah, we exactly. were, we talk about this yeah. with the military operators. They should definitely, you know, I believe that you should get w at least one opinion that is standardized, Ooh. traditional care. And, you know, I encourage people to not just go into this alternative realm. I mean, right. I I'm definitely, I mean, that's why we're both, you know, we're both conventionally trained. And I think there's a very much like if you have a stage one breast cancer or stage two breast cancer, that's like locally invasive, get that removed and do the, do conventional chemo or, or radiation. Maybe, maybe. And then, but also think about what are those adjunctive things that, that you can do. And then what brought you to the place where your body was sort of at that place where you were getting the the cancer grow in a sense like almost all this is the thing about the work that i do in, in in the health optimization medicine framework is that it's not mutually exclusive to somebody that's extremely healthy or that somebody that has cancer that's metastatic like everybody needs optimized levels of vitamins minerals and nutrients and their gut health needs to be optimized and i don't know if you know my, my colleague dr nisha winters and and some of her work on the metabolic approach but we talk a lot about this ter she talks about terrain like you need to have the optimized terrain in your diet and that's optimized terrain in your cells, in your gut, in your, your system, and to really be able to treat cancer effectively. And so it's the same thing. And so you know, she and I have worked along with Dom, like looking at fasting before chemotherapy, for example. And we know this helps decrease symptoms of chemotherapy toxicity. And why is that? Yeah. Because you have ketones floating around. And so there's a lot of ideas here of how hyperbaric therapy and, and the ketogen ketogenic diet might work. But the the main idea is that you're you're pressing with the ketogenic diet, so you're starving the cancer potentially, and then you're bringing in more oxygen and more oxidative load, all this oxygen into the system with the hyperbaric chambers, and then the cells that are at risk for not being able to deal with that oxygen load, well, don't do well, and then they die. Like So this is the cancer cells, for example. So over the years, it's been really evident that, and this is obvious, is that the sooner we can get people inside the chamber, ketogenic, the lower the stage of the cancer, the more benefit that we're going to see. But And are you guys, uh, we have started to do early detection cancer mm. screening. Uh, I don't know if you're using it. If you're not, I'd love to share the testing with you. Yeah, I'd love to talk more about it. I'm, I'm just starting. I know that a lot more people are getting involved in this side. I haven't started using it operationally in practice yet, but I'm super interested. Yeah, it'd be, it'd be interesting. Give me, as we begin to wrap up, give me your top three health tips it could be anything because sure. i already know meditation is going to be on there yeah, yeah give me yeah your top three or any advice that you would give a listener um and maybe it's not medical quite frankly yeah you know we've talked about so many good ones already this time and you, you you've already kind of got my first one which is if you can start a meditative practice it is transformative. I only started when I was 37. I'm, I'm 42 now. So you don't, there's no like late time to start. And I really do feel like if, if people can start adding more of this 
into their day. It's a good reset. And we know it's, I mean, there's lots of research about meditation and how it's help, It's really helpful in a lot of metrics that you can measure in brain function and cardiovascular health. And if those things care, if you care about those things, which we all do. But I think a meditative practice is extremely important. Um, I think the other major sort of umbrella thing here is that stop, chasing the new supplement, the new technology, even hyperbaric therapy, the new fill in the blank that you see on the wall, if you can, and look at finding a practitioner to work with that can help you with the foundation of what you're trying to provide for the rest of your life, for your longevity. If you can do that, all the other stuff will fall into place. You can play with all the fun toys. You can get a hyperbaric chamber. You can get a sauna. You can do all those fun things. You can take that cool supplement you heard about on a podcast. I'm sure you've done these lectures as, as well, and I've done it where I've asked people how many people take supplements, and 90% of people will raise their hands. And I'll say how many people have actually measured what they needed and are taking supplements related to targeted reasons for what they found on deficiencies and toxicities in their system, and maybe 5% of people will raise their hands. All my patients better be raising their hands. Damn right, yeah. right? and my patients too. And so if you can just bring people to, towards a place where they're looking at a framework, of, of how they're optimizing their health. I, and I don't really care what that is, as long as it's like a framework that they feel comfortable with. Functional medicine, health optimization medicine, I know you're doing your training too. Everybody's got a different spin on this, but I think in, in general, it's the basics that matter. So if you can start and, and, and work on that foundation, all the other stuff is kind of fun and games. And just like icing on the cake kind of deal. Is there a third thing? And that's gluten-free, calorie-free cake, if anyone's listening. <laughs> Of course, some calories are okay too. And I, I think that, that I think it brings up a good point too, is that we all can get crazy and all can get the opposite in the sense of the orthorexic community, in the sense of like getting so strict about things that it becomes a problem in itself. And so I think it's important that if you're going to do something and have that cake, enjoy the cake, enjoy it, right? And don't feel bad about it. I mean, if you want to take some charcoal with it or apple cider vinegar and do all those things, that's fine. Go sp do I, sprint intervals. I may or may not do those things too. However, enjoy what you're doing. You know, be, I think, and it comes back to just being in that present moment and just saying, just own it, you know? And I think this is something that you talk about too, right? Just own what you're doing and this is, and be aware of it. So, and, and, and have fun. And, and it doesn't have to be always so structured all the time. In my life, I was always I always felt so structured, and I always thought I needed to be. And then, as soon as I started having children, they told me I couldn't be so structured. And I had to be flexible, and that was really hard for me initially. But now it's like, yeah, let's just go. You know, let's just let's just go with the flow. And and I and I talk to my daughter every night. I'm like, let's go with the flow. You know, flexibility is the key. So, metabolic flexibility, physical flexibility, cognitive flexibility. I can't do. I can't. Do, I can't, you know, I can't do all the flexibility stuff I want to on, on the physical flexibility yet, but I'm working on it. You know? But so these are things, and the other thing I guess is just everything's a work in progress, right? It's a process. It's not the end result that matters. And I think that that's something my father told me when I was a kid and something that I hated hearing when I was a, ch a kid, especially when you're going through medical school. Like, oh, you know, just enjoy the process. Enjoy the process. You're like, fuck the process. But, mm -hmm. but if that's really what it's all about, life is a process. And that's what we are we're experiencing all the time. I think that's beautiful. That's the ultimate in the growth trajectory mindset, just a, a way of, a beautiful way of being. Dr. Scott, thank you so much for spending some time with me. I, of course, will link everything below and people will find you and thank you so much. This has been great. I, I've been really enjoying the, the time in person and communicating this way and keep up the great work as always, Gabrielle. Thank you, my friend.